We are delighted to have Dr. Mark Yarbrough as our speaker today. And uh, I'm not just saying that because he's my boss. Since July 2020, he has served as the sixth president of Dallas Theological Seminary, in addition to serving as professor of Bible exposition. Dr. Yarbrough's twin passions for the local church and theological education have worked together for over 30 years. Along with his responsibilities as president at DTS, he enjoys leading tours and speaking at conferences. Mark has authored several books, including How to Read the Bible Like a Seminary Professor. Those of you in BE 5101, you might want to pick that one up. Uh, uh, Jonah, Beyond the Tale of a Whale, and Tidings of Comfort and Joy. He has been married to Jennifer, his high school sweetheart, for over 30 years, and they have four adult children and a son-in-law. In his spare time, he enjoys being outdoors with a fly fishing rod. Will you help me welcome Dr. Mark Yarbrough? Well, on our first chapel, I would like to bring my greetings to every one of you. It is good to see you here. For those of you that were able to participate on Friday evening in our convocation ceremony, it was a wonderful time to greet our new students. But I would certainly like to say good morning to our new students that are here. For our returning students, for our faculty and staff that are joining in, this is what we do as a community of faith at Dallas Seminary. And so I hope you're here ready to begin a new semester. I hope you have a smile on your face. I hope you have not been participating yet in syllabus shock or all of those things that have uh, the opening beginnings of semester for us, but we can remember again why we are here. It has been my privilege over the last year to step a little further into our core values one at a time. And so we started off a year ago looking at why we, as a family at Dallas Seminary, trust in God's Word. Then we stepped into the next one, which is to remember that we are dependent upon the Lord. Today, I am privileged to direct our thinking towards the importance of loving others above ourselves. Before we get started, let's pray again together. Lord, Thank you for dear friends. Thank you for new friends. Lord, thank you for new opportunities. Help us today as Dr. Bramer has also prayed for our hearts to be in tune with the working of your Spirit. As we push the pause button in classes and in our work here on campus and come together as a community of faith, Lord, please do what only you can do. May we be receptive to your word. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I read a book over the summer. It was a fascinating book. It was full of data. It had stories that I had never heard. It got me thinking about things. It changed the way I thought about certain things. It's a book that I highly recommend to every one of you, especially of those of you that have intriguing minds. It It's the Guinness Book of World Records 2023. (laughs) And it's an amazing book. I don't know if you have read this before, but, you know, you get into this and you start reading these very strange stories. I, I read about the oldest person in the world, Sister Andre Lucille Rendon. You ever heard of her? Well, she holds the record for the oldest living person, the oldest living woman, the oldest living nun, she's an Anglican nun, and the oldest survivor of (laughs) COVID-19. Now, I'm thinking like you could say anything because she is the oldest, so it's like the oldest person to brush your teeth, the (laughs) oldest person to put on clothes. I mean, you could come up with anything, but she's documented for those things. She is 119 years of age. Stunning. There's a little video you can go and watch about her. It's actually the cutest thing you've ever seen because she does this little interview on this video and she says things like, they're like, well, what's your day like? You know, and she says, well, they wake me up at seven. 
She said, no, God wakes me up at seven. That's what she says. It's great. God wakes me up at seven and I eat breakfast. And she says, and then they wheel me to my desk and there I work. And this is what she said. It was the greatest thing. She says, I do naughty things. And you're like, oh my, what is this Anglican nun going to say? And she says, I eat chocolate. (laughs) Isn't that great? And then she says something about that's what keeps her alive to 119 years of age. Okay, I also read about this person. You probably hadn't heard of her. Diana Armstrong. She holds the record of the cumulative length, the greatest cumulative length of fingernails. If you could see this picture, I don't know how she sleeps, I don't know how she works, I have no idea what this woman does for a living, but here's what I can tell you about her. If you add up the length of all 10 nails on her hands, it comes to 42 feet and 10 inches. Or I could tell you about one of my personal favorites here, the man who has eaten the most McDonald Big Macs. He is over the age of 50, surprisingly. (laughs) He eats 14 of the twin patty treats each week. The longest that he has gone between eating Big Macs is eight days. And his record to this day, documented, is he has now eaten 32,672 Big Macs. And if you are like me, you are thinking, why? (laughs) It's funny, I got way too fascinated with this particular book, and it got me thinking about everybody that's recorded in this particular book right here. They're known for something. You know, they've got a record, they've got a fact, maybe just by their being, but maybe they chased after something bizarre, but they're recorded in the Guinness Book of World Records, and they're known for that. Here's what hit me. What if, hypothetically, God had his own Guinness Book? After salvation, people like you and me that have trusted in the Lord Jesus, everyone was placed in God's book. And if he opened it up, went to the wise, my last name's Yarbrough, and found a picture of Mark Yarbrough there, what would I be known for? How about you? What would your life as a believer exhibit? Yeah, maybe it would say something like, you know, started a church and grew it. Or maybe for new students, you know, did an amazing job at DTS and made all A's. This is fictitious, by the way. You know. <laughs> Led their office with precision and passion. For the faculty. Taught the best class ever and received stunning reviews. Like I said, it's fictitious. I think the real question that we should ask, what does God desire to see written about us? Let me phrase it this way, if you will. What observable fruit should Christ's followers display? Jesus says there's one thing that should be displayed in two ways, and apparently, it is what God wants to see in His children. The first thing is this, and we're going to see Jesus' words. It should be love that is expressed in service. Love that is expressed in service. John chapter 15, verse 12 says this. I'm going to ask that you'd read it with me. 
My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Say it again, please. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. John chapter 15, you know it well. It is a large swath of Scripture, 13 through 17, which sometimes is identified as the upper room discourse. You know, there's a whole bunch of things that happen in this particular portion of Scripture. Jesus celebrates the Passover feast, right, with His disciples. Fascinatingly enough, Luke wants us to know in chapter 22 that right after they finished celebrating the Passover feast, the guys had an argument about who was going to be the greatest. Isn't that perfect? It's fascinating. In the immediate context of this verse of which we just read, Jesus talks about the importance of abiding. It's His disciples being connected to the true vine. You are keenly aware of these portions of Scripture. But notice in the particular verse that we just read, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. What I think I would charge and what I think is presented in this passage is that one of the ways that love is displayed is through service, by being in a position of servitude. As a matter of fact, if you recall, in John chapter 13, when this entire episode of Jesus occurs in His teaching, what is it that Jesus does to start the grand narrative? You know it well. What does He do? He takes off His outer cloak. And what's He do? He gets down and He washes the disciples' feet. And He says, now what you have seen Me display let that be part of your life. May that be what you are known for. Love in action. Agapao, this word that shows up all throughout the text, it's a word of saying to cherish, have affection, a, a devotion for. But what we see is that Jesus expressed His love continually through Service. He came as a servant. That great kenosis passage in Philippians chapter 2. He modeled humility and compassion. And I would argue contextually that when he says, love as I have loved you, he means serving one another. It's not a theology of works, but a theology of love expression. And as we saw Him in that posture of continual servitude, friends, that is what we are called to emulate. See, when God opens up that hypothetical book, I think He wants to see us, His children, who have been given all things to express that love in service. Our Savior modeled it. What does that look like for you and for me? Well, it may mean serving in the church, serving one another, caring for the needs of others. It may be being connected in a variety of ministries. Friends, that's why this is a core value at Dallas Theological Seminary. We are called to love others above ourselves. We want to put our hands where our head is and frequently where our mouth is, that it shows a consistency of what we say and what we do. Well, I have a call to action for us. I'm super excited about this. A call to action. Our love is certainly supposed to be expressed in service, but I'm happy to announce that we are going to be doing something a little bit different to help move us this direction of the importance of loving others above ourselves. We are going to have an annual service project. 
And we're going, what, what does this look like? An annual service project. In order to be part of our DNA, to get us together as a community of faith, to be able to work alongside of one another, faculty and staff and students and alumni, all of our constituency, just as an emblematic presentation of what it means as a community of faith to be able to express the gospel visibly. You see, these are always connected, are they not? That's why when Jesus was asked what? Teacher, what are the greatest commandments? And you know the words. It's love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. And the second is what? Like it, it's love your neighbor as yourself. The two must always be connected. Now, there are many ways that we can do this, but one way, one simple way that we're going to do this together is that we're going to partner with a local ministry called Feed My Starving Children. They are gospel-centered, they are Jesus-loving, and they serve. And we're going to have an opportunity to just work with them for a couple of hours for those that choose to do so. Just as a little promo, I want you to know a little bit about what this fabulous ministry does. Let's watch this. Imagine a world without hunger. This is the world we dream of. A world where bright futures are the norm, where children, families, and communities thrive. But every year, millions of children are still dying from preventable causes, such as pneumonia, diarrhea, malaria, and undernutrition. Hunger causes nearly half of deaths in children under five years old. In spite of all this, we know that hope is not lost. It starts with food. And it starts with all of us. We believe in feeding kids. As a Christian nonprofit, we're dedicated to seeing every child whole in body and spirit. Nutrition allows children to grow, thrive, and develop to their full potential. We believe in feeding spirits of children around the world and volunteers and donors. We love like Jesus, with abandon, because He first loved us. We believe our lives are made better when we give our time and resources to help others. We believe in empowering communities, that all people deserve the dignity of self-reliance. We work with food distribution partners that stay with communities for the long haul, empowering them to move from relief to development. Imagine a world without hunger. It's not just a dream, it's a possibility. And it's because of you. There are lots of ways that we can take the gospel and show it. We're called to do that in our lives individually, every day. But we think it's a good practice for us as a family to be able to say, hey, here's one project that we can rally around together. You may not be able to serve in this capacity, and we certainly understand that. There's no coercion. But I'm happy to tell you that it's now live. It's real. We're going to have this project on Thursday, September 21. If you want to participate, and you can even sign up for it now, there's the QR code, it's going to be something that is so compact. There's going to be a big giant bus that shows up here in the afternoon about 1 o'clock, and we'll leave from this campus. We'll drive to their facilities, and by God's grace, it has been provided that 50,000 meals have been purchased. And we're going to be privileged to pack that up together and to pray over how God will use that and to pray for a blessing upon that particular ministry. It's one small tangible way of loving well, loving through service. And let me tell you, friends, something happens when a community of faith, when a family of faith in your local individual homes when your individual church, and I would say even in a school of which you're all associated, when we have the privilege of putting our hands together and showing the love of Jesus because 
I'm fully convinced when God opens that hypothetical book and he sees a picture, one of the things that he's hoping and praying to see is love expressed in service. Well, that's certainly not it. I told you that there are two particular divisions of this call to love. It's love expressed in service, but the text also reminds us it's love expressed in sacrifice. Listen to how Jesus follows this up, and I would invite you to please read this passage with me. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. Say it again, please. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. Love for a friend reaches its zenith when one willingly sacrifices his or her life for that friend. Jesus had spoken of follow my lead and serve. He had shown his disciples, even in that particular environment, he would shortly show them how great his love was by making the supreme sacrifice for them. And that they would not only have his command to obey, but also his example to follow. The amazing thing to me in this particular passage in seeing the life of Jesus is that he did more than just lay down his life for his friends. He died for his enemies. And friends, that includes us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I hope you see what Jesus is doing here in modeling and teaching. He is raising the bar. And if we are to love like Him, we are to serve like Him, but we are also called to sacrifice like He sacrificed, giving His life for others. Love expressed in service and love expressed in sacrifice. What does that sacrifice look like for you and me? Does that mean giving my physical life for a brother or sister? Does it mean giving my life because of my faith? Possibly so. The martyrs have certainly paved a path for that. Does it mean laying down my desires for the growth of others? At times. Does it mean coming to DTS and choosing to work or teach here when I could have had another lucrative opportunity? I believe it does. Does it mean sacrificing my time and my finances, students, to be better equipped for future service for Him? I think it does. Love expressed in service is a tangible expression of the love that He has bestowed upon us. But love expressed in sacrifice is a position of gratitude that lets go of self simply because He is worthy. I'm excited about the opportunity to reflect God's love by serving at Feed My Starving Children. It's one small way of loving a great ministry and loving others above ourselves. But we also have the challenge and the privilege to express love in sacrifice. And that position reminds us that it is not about me. It's about the one worthy of giving my everything. And that includes every part of my life. We're called to lay it all down for Him. Well, some of you were like, what in the world's over here? And you know who you are. <laughs> let, me, let me take this off. This is fascinating. Chess. Anybody play chess in the room? 
No one plays chess? Come on. Own your nerdship. Come on now. <laughs> Back in the day, I played a little chess. Um, it's a fun game. It actually started in the 6th century in India. Thank you to our friends from India. It's amazing, you know, there's all these pieces and there's one side and another, and it's a game, right? There's a competition, and we all kind of get it. Um, I'm always fascinating with the pieces. This one right here. This is a pawn. It's, it's the most plentiful on the board, right? You can see that. It's a pawn. And pawns can only do certain things. They can move forward. And they can move forward, okay? That's what a pawn does. And you can see them up here. We've got them listed for you. This is what is called a rook. It looks like a little castle. And these guys are pretty cool because they can go this way and that way, and that's it. So they have to follow the blocks that are in front of them. So I've always been fascinated with that. You can see this. This is a knight. If I was going to be a chess piece, I think I'd be a knight just because I like horses, right? And so you got a little horse right here. These guys are amazing because they can go one up and two over, or they can go two up and one over, and that's the way they kind of work through the board. These guys are fascinating. It's called a bishop and a bishop, um, they can go diagonal, and that's it, based upon the color. So if you're on the, the white squares or the dark squares, you, can, you just follow, and that's all you can do. Now, this is a very important piece. This is the queen. And the queen is amazing because the queen can really do like everybody's job, right? And the queen can go this way and that way and sideways and up and down and backwards, you know, and like a pawn. Queens are a pretty powerful piece. But it's fascinating to me when you get into the game, you realize that all these pieces, the ones that I just mentioned, they really have one job. They're subservient to the king. Friends, we are privileged because we have been called of God and we have moved from death to life, right? Shake your head, yes. Somebody give me an amen on that. Get over, get over syllabus shock and say amen on that, okay? Every one of us has a place on this board because we've been called by God. But I know that every one of these pieces right here Their job is to give their life for one other piece. It's why we have this core value at Dallas Seminary. We are called to be able to be looked up in this hypothetical book. And when the world sees your picture and mine, sees us as a seminary family, a community of faith, there you go. That's a person that loves. How do I know it? Well, they show it and they serve. It's a reflection of an inner issue. But they also are men and women of faith that lay down their lives. Because there's only one piece. Lord, thank you for your goodness and your grace as we start this new semester. Lord, help us to love through service and sacrifice. In Jesus' name, our ultimate example, we say amen.